Who was Aaron Taylor growing up? Um, Aaron Taylor growing up was a average kid who got good grades and, you know, grew up in a time when uh, elementary school was teaching a lot of black history and a lot of black awareness, black uh, black pride. You know, we sang uh, Young, Gifted, and Black growing up in school. When I graduated from elementary school in the sixth grade, we sang Young, Gifted, and Black at the graduation. I got bused to school from Los Angeles out to the San Fernando Valley, the Northridge Junior High School. Uh, that experience was my first experience with people of other races. And um, it was during that same time that Roots was on television by Alex Haley. So it was a lot of racial strife, and that was my first experience uh, within a type, with any type of interracial activity. Having that experience then, um, along with Roots, made me uh, racially conscious of who I was versus just being socially conscious as a young kid, you know? And then that's when the interactions with the police started to get uh, a lot greater as well. African-American awareness, right, helped shape me, even through my gang banging years later on, you know, being conscious of who I was as a black person in America. How was your environment growing up? But you said, you mentioned gang banging, so how was that for you as a younger age before that? Before that, my grandfather, Mr. L.B. Turner, was still alive, and you wasn't doing nothing in L.B. Turner's house, period. You know, <laughs> he was from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and my grandmother was from Birmingham, Alabama, so you had that, that country upbringing inside the house. You know, kids are to be seen and not heard. On Saturday morning, the oldies come on, you get up and clean up. You know, uh, no sitting around in the house, you go outside and play. You knew to be in before the street lights came on. And if you did something wrong down the street, your neighbor would whoop you, and then they would call your parents and tell them what you did, and then they would whoop you when you get home, and you would be getting on punishment. So uh, living in that house, yeah, the gangbanger was out. That was not going to happen because the biggest gangbanger was my godfather, and you couldn't whoop him, so, you know. <laughs> you, you gave me a song, Knucklehead, by Grover Washington Jr. Yeah. What does that remind you of? So Knucklehead reminds me of my rap career, me and Jerome Dickerson. We, uh, we had a rap group called Doom City Rockers in Los Angeles. And Knucklehead was the first song we actually sampled and put to a beat that actually was quality enough to make it on the radio and be heard. Uh, the problem with that was our manager at the time took us over to DJ Pooh's house in Culver City. And he played the song for Pooh and Pooh distinctly said, damn, I was finna do that for T, right? And I looked at Jerome and told him, we can forget that song. And a month later, they was on the on the radio, King T and Ice Cube, uh, the song they did was played like a piano. But they used a sample from Knucklehead. So Knucklehead represents that. Knucklehead represents uh, Jerome's father and my stepfather, uh, George Jernigan, and uh, Jerome Dickinson Sr. both had jazz collections, right? So during my formulation and rap in the beginning, they was always trying to get us to put jazz into it but we didn't catch on until Guru from Gangstar started sampling jazz and his. Then it was like, oh, now that's what we were supposed to be doing? Oh, stupid, right? So we get in the game late, right? But we still had some quality records. We just didn't sell anything, right? But we still had quality jazz samples on top of hip hop beats, uh, like Rick Rubin style beats. I have a segment on this show called Life of a Five-Year-Old where I talk about my relationship with my father. What do you want to say about your relationship with your dad, your biological? So I never really had one. Um, I remember seeing my father twice in life. Once when I was, I think I was four or five, and we were driving and I was sitting in his lap holding the steering wheel like most fathers do, they sons, and you know, pretending that I'm driving. And I distinctly remember us traveling south on La Brea, going across Jefferson and making a turn where the old blue chip stamp place used to be, and now it's warehouses and stuff over there. I remember that. And then the next time I saw my father, I was 12 years old. Uh, he was in a drug recovery house and their house burned. So they went over to the Kazi house where my mother was a drug counselor and they talked and he was like, well, you know, can I see my son? And uh, she said, yeah, so brought me over, uh, put me in a room with him. And I remember, I can remember the cologne he smelled like, I can remember him talking, but I don't remember what he was saying other than I see you, I heard you play baseball, do you need a new glove? And I was like, yeah. And I think it was a week later, he OD'd, you know. And they told me at the time that he had a heart attack. He was 32 years old. I'm, 
11 or 12. And so as far as I know, my father died of a heart attack up until I got older. Then I found out what it was. But the individual that, the two individuals beside my grandfather who were the greatest impressions on me as a father was William Fant Jr., who's my younger brother's father, right, and George Jernigan. William Fant Jr., uh, my brother's father, just as a father figure, man, was like, you know, one of the most loving men I've ever, I can remember. Um, he did anything and everything that a father was supposed to do. And the only reason I didn't have his last name is because he didn't leave, he couldn't get through the legal adoption to get me, right? Or else my last name would have been Fant as well. And then my mother broke up with him and she had another boyfriend. But then when she met George Jernigan, right? George Jernigan was, I mean, this dude is phenomenal, man. He taught me how to hunt, taught me how to fish, taught me how to make a fire from scratch. You know, uh, we used to go fishing and hunting. We used to go to the Salton Sea when it was still good for fishing and stuff. You know, we would fish up there. Uh, he taught, he was a further continuation on manhood training. You know, never raise your voice at a woman, never raise your hand at a woman. You know, respectful, open doors, the whole get down, an extension of what my mother had tried to instill in us before we had this father figure in our life in George. So uh, Jack Taylor may have uh, birthed me into the world, but George Jernigan is my father. You mentioned uh, a baseball glove conversation with your dad. So what, what sports did you play? I played all sports growing up. I wasn't good at much of them, though, but I played them all. You know, I got hit in the eye, a foul ball up at uh, 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 it's a park on uh, 42nd and Central. Uh, I'm gonna think of the name of it in a minute. But anyway, a foul ball comes out of the sky and hits me in the eye. So that terrified me from standing at the plate, having somebody throw something at me <laughs> for the rest of my life. Even underhand fast speed softball, right? Spooks the hell out of me, right? I don't like nothing that fast coming at me. In contrast, I've been in so many gun battles and heard bullets whizzing around me. I'm not even phased by that. You know, so you would figure, right? Man, this dude's been in gun battles. He's talking about bullets. <laughs> and anybody that's ever been in a gun battle, whether in the military or on the street, you know the sound I'm talking about. You know, the sound is death, 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 death. Whizzing all around. And I'm calm, cool, and collected. But you hit me with an overhand 90-mile-an-hour fastball, and I'm standing at the plate shivering, right? <laughs> Because I don't want to get hit by this hard ball. Football was one of my favorite sports. Did you get your bell rang in football? Yeah, oh, everybody does. If you did, if anybody you ever interviewed told me I never had my bell rang playing football, it's lying. Everybody gets their bell rung playing football. Uh, basketball was a sport I played, but I wasn't good at. Um, as I got older, I matured into basketball. So one of my closest friends growing up was uh, Cordy Dillard. This is when I get to the uh, 16 to all the way up until I went to jail. So it would be 16 to 28. And so Cordy is an avid Lakers fan. He uh, led the uh, led the Crenshaw Cougars to the city to the city championship in the 79-80 season. And uh, this dude is this is my partner. And so my basketball development comes from watching Magic Johnson on the court. And then my homeboy, who's emulating Magic Johnson on the court as well, sitting down explaining to me what he's looking at as a point guard, right? And how he sees the court and what he sees develop before anybody else sees the development on the court. So while I'm learning how to play on the wing with him, I'm also getting a, a schooling in the X's and O's, right? Which leads me into the play-by-play -play later on and how I'm able to make the calls that I'm making, which makes me just a little bit more unique than the rest of them. Did I segue that good for you? Yeah, you did. You know what I'm saying? It was a setup. You just threw that softball <laughs> up in the air. It was an underhand slow pitch softball, and I had that 33 aluminum bat, and I just let it happen. <laughs> Bing! That's gone. <laughs> Any other sport? Uh, as far as uh, partaking in, I was on a Dorsey swim team. Um, I came in fourth in the city of... Uh, in the city championships back in 1982. Um, I played water polo as well. Uh, yeah, I am a 
kid from inner city Los Angeles. Yes, and I swam and I played water polo. You know, don't hate on me. <laughs> you gave me a song for your mom, the Isley Brothers. I got work to do. I'm taking care of business. Woman, can't you see? As my mother, man, she always was trying to work, even through her trials and tribulations, her ups and downs. You know, when we lived with her, she was trying to work. She always had work to do. Um, she worked at Yellow Cab from like 1977, I think, to 1982 or 83. And she went from being a driver to a dispatcher. And, um, and then after that, you know, she had some pitfalls and whatnot. But even after the pitfalls, after I went to prison, she got back up again and became a strong member of the church. And so she always put herself in a position where she had work to do. And the last 20 years or so of her life, the work she was doing was making herself serviceable to somebody else, not necessarily herself. So that self-sacrifice for others uh, kind of runs in my family as well, too. You know, <clears throat> the Bible, for me, I'm learning, says to honor your father and mother, like that was a real promise in those commandments. Mm -hmm. and, and what I've learned for myself is the spirit behind how we talk about our father and mother is really what the, the, the conversation is. Like, like you mentioned, I, I too had stepfathers who raised me. Like my dad was there, but there was men who my mom were with who stepped in to, to raise me. And so it's not that you have to, um, it says honor your father and mother, but you don't have to obey them because they might be telling you crazy stuff to do, True. which may not, you know, it gives you your judgment on that. What do you want to say t to your mom as far as you, being in prison, like, did, did that impact her at all? So, the way I was raised was uh, uh, my mother and my uncles and whatnot, even though I spoke about the positive ro uh, male role models, we was raised, you know, in the streets the same way they were. And so, um, I remember a telephone call when I was going to take my 50 to life deal. And I called my mother, I'm down in the bullpen in, uh, in Torrance Court. And I called her up and I said, I got to go in here and take this 50 to life. And I heard her catch her breath. And she was getting ready to cry. And I told her, you can't cry because this is how you raise me. You raise me that, you know, if you live a life of crime, this is a possibility. If you cry now, I'm going to cry in here and all these other dudes are going to see me now. So to these dudes in the bullpen, you would think that I didn't know them, but I did because I've been going to court for so long and people had seen me and knew my story of, of leading up to that point that I had that folk hero respect inside of jail. And so my mother caught her breath and she was like, all right, I ain't gonna cry for her. I said, yeah, just hold on to it. You can do it when I get off the phone. Uh, leaving my mother alone, while well, I went and did 26 years, is, uh, it was rough because my brother died in 2006. So there was nobody there from her womb who could be there to protect her the way that I would. And so from 2006 until 2020, when I got out, those 14 years were the roughest because I, you know, I'm teaching guys in prison how to take care of themselves. And the only charge I gave them was when you get out, go stop by and take care of my mother and check on her, you know, and to a man they did. They would go by there, she'd be like, another guy showed up and gave me the telephone number and said, if I need anything to call, he was like, what are you teaching them? I said, don't, don't worry about it, you know. Them, them dudes will be by there if you make a telephone call and they'll come in there and wreck shop if necessary, or they'll come there and, you know, if you need some money, they'll stop through and give you some money or whatever, but it's because of the way that I handled myself inside. It gave me a little bit of comfort but there's nothing like leaving your mother alone and unprotected. So now, you know, it's a trip getting out because when I went in, my mother was a young woman. And when I get out, the first time I see her, she looks like how my grandmother looked when I left the street, you know? And that transformation was shocking. You know, 26 years really snapped in my face when I seen my mother come around the end of the car with a walking stick like Yoda, you know? Literally bent over with a walking stick, gray, I'm a, you know, but then I have to look at myself in the mirror too. I went from 28 to 55. You know, parts of me still feel 28 or 29, but I see 
the 55 year old, but I also see in my eyes. Appreciate that. The 29 year old that's still there. Appreciate that. And so uh, it, it's a little rough sometimes when I get to that, you know, because a lot of my youth went up in there. And when I seen it in my mother, it was like, damn, this is how I looked at everybody else, you know, so. Cue ball, man, we thank Kevin Durant for it, man. He came in and seen the program and seen what we was doing and uh, decided to send a film crew in to uh, get on camera. Uh, a program that was really geared toward uh, instilling young men uh, with some grounding and some responsibility uh, within a prison section to be prepared for this basketball game that plays that gets played once a year. Uh, the fame that comes from it, I got out of prison, man, and before I even left out of isolation, uh, quarantine, man, I had literally like four movie companies, um, the VVL, uh, I had an offer from some league in Australia and another offer from a Turkish league, you know, simply just because I was a part of Q-Ball. Um, maybe if I'd have been 35, I might have treated it different, but at 55, it was just like, you know. What it do, huh? Yeah, you know, I was cool with it, you know. What What part of your athletic career inspired the play-by-play? -play? So we used to play ball up at Overland Park in Culver City. And um, one weekend I went up there, I caught a ride with Cordy Dillard, and I twisted my ankle going up for a rebound, but I couldn't leave because I didn't have a car. I, I rode with him. So I distinctly remember going to the ice chest, grabbing a Corona, hopping up on the bleachers, popping the cap off, taking a swig back, and I looked at the court like this, and I just started imitating Chick Hearn. I mean, I wasn't any good back then. It was all in fun. Everybody's laughing, but I was pretty much on point, but I, I wasn't Chick Hearn by then. When I got to prison, it was like, what? <laughs> I got 50 life. I need to try to figure out a way to beat depression, you know? So uh, one of my partners who I knew from the county jail said, man, they got some really good ballers out there on the basketball court. And so I went out there and I stood by the pole and I looked and I watched. I said, okay, it is some pretty good basketball players. Opened up my mouth and start talking, and we sitting here. <laughs> no doubt. You know, uh, it was different on the level four though because it's hella violent, you know, and people had to get used to the jokes I was saying. Now, thankfully, I had a little bit of a reputation from my gang banging days, and I knew enough people from across a wide swath of the population that wasn't nobody gonna let nothing happen to me. Where you going? You ain't going nowhere. You sitting up here for this interview, man. Where you think you going, bro? I'm going to watch my tablet. Okay, go watch your tablet, man. Make sure you stick, be quiet over there. Stay out the way. Wave at the camera on your way out. <laughs> I <All> got right. you. <laughs> and so uh, I had enough people who knew me and I had a little reputation where wasn't nobody going to be trying to beat up on me. Because I used to have some cold one-liners, right? And they come out, you know, when I'm spitting them, they, they, they hit you. Like you know? insults, huh? Yeah, yeah, they are. And people can hear you when you're doing it the way I'm doing it. Now that I'm going straight into the camera... They don't hear it until later, right? So now you're chasing me down later. After, man, I saw the tape, uh, Showtime. I heard what you said about my mama. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it might have been a joke like, yeah, his mother must have taught him how to shoot free throws. That's because he missed that one, right? And the next thing you know, it turns into a Commander McBrag story. There, there I was. Did I ever tell you about the time P for E whole team had me surrounded at Watts Oasis when I said something about this boy's mama? <laughs> <laughs> But the jokes and the one-liners help keep the game moving and it help keeps it it keeps it moving for the people that are watching it. Because the way they have play by play now, everybody's trying to be so professional that they become vanilla, you know, and nobody wants to make a mistake. Everybody's scared to say the wrong thing, so they're not saying nothing even though they're talking. There's a specific word for that. I can't think of the definition of it, but there is a word that describes people who are saying a bunch of words that have absolutely no meaning or weight to them. And that's what play-by-play -play has turned to on a professional level. And I don't mean to disrespect anybody from ESPN, Fox, Spectrum News, or whatever channel you want doing this stuff. The minute, the minute that they put headphones on me and I can slide a microphone in front of my mouth, 
Somebody in the NBA or the NCAA is about to lose their job. Period. I'm going to move away from your past a little bit to the last one of the songs you gave me, which is NWA. F the police. And I can't play that on the radio because of the FCC laws, but I'm sure everybody knows the intro, the first four bars. So what is it about NWA's F the police? So when that song came out, in Los Angeles, uh, it was like really, really volatile between the black community and the police. Um, this is like, the song came out right before the Rodney King beating. You know, the police was pulling any and everybody over that was black with a baseball cap on in a car. Um, I'm not really a fan of the police. You know, uh, I've seen my stepfather, William Fat Jr. get beat down by the police. I watched my stepfather, George Jernigan, get pulled over by the police on numerous occasions. Uh, by the time I was 12 years old, they had a file on me in the um, on a, a car that labeled me a gangbanger before I was even in a gang. So I really don't have any love for the police, uh, at least for the ones that was in my neighborhood. Uh, with that being said, I do understand that there are good police officers. I just wish some of them was in my neighborhood, you know. Yeah. And so... Leading into the uh, the King uprisings, uh, the the court system in and of itself, and the police as well, would use videotape to lock people up: bank robbers, jewel thieves, uh, uh, shoplifters, and everything else. So now we finally have videotape evidence of what happened, or what we've been saying that has been happening, when no cameras are around, and. You know, they said that wasn't enough. And so that particular day that the riots jumped off, that song was playing everywhere. And I came from Compton to First Sammy Church and was over there as one of the guys that was like, uh, you know, just venting. And uh, there was a handful of people talking about, you know, let's make sure we stay peaceful and whatnot. But the majority of us was like, no, nah, ain't no time for no peace no more because Every time we be peaceful, we end up ending up getting getting it even worse. So I made end up making a statement that was recorded by Rhythm Rock Radio, who was there doing some recording, as well as Henry Alfaro from Channel 7 News. And the statement ended up as the intro to Dr. Dre's third song on the Chronic album called The Day the Niggas Took Over. The intro in the beginning is me, a 26-year-old black man frustrated with the system, frustrated with being treated like an animal, Frustrated with being treated as guilty first, innocent second. Frustrated with not having a good uh, 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 political system that I could vent my frustrations to and they get answered. You know, and so my intro statement, I'm going to say this and I'm going to end mine. If you ain't down for the Africans here in the United States, period, point blank. If you ain't down for the ones that suffered in South Africa from apartheid and then you devils need to step your punk ass to the side and let us brothers and us Africans step in and put some foot in that ass. And I'm saying it with an X shirt on and an X beanie on, and it's on YouTube now, but in the beginning, uh, it wasn't. There was no proof that it was me other than the people who knew my voice. And, uh, you know, that, that statement has echoed now across the decades to meet me in 2021. Because in... In 1992, there was no Black Lives Matter that we know of. You know, it was it was people that was moving in blackness. But in a sense, and I told somebody this and they looked at me and said, you know what, you're right. In a sense, I was Black Lives Matter before Black Lives Matter was Black Lives Matter. You know, there was also what happened to Reginald Denny, which is a juxtaposition to my statement. My statement in no shape, form or fashion supports the actions that took place against Reginald Denny. Although my statement does reflect the frustrations of what happened to Reginald Denny. I in no way support what happened to Reginald Denny. Reginald Denny was a man who was trying to get home or get to where he was going to. And he's just in a sense, just like me, frustrated with the system and has no way to figure out how we can get this right. You know, uh, and now, like I said, my words are echoing across the decades into 2021. And I'm hoping that 29 years later, 
we can finally start to get this thing right. Because in 1992, we didn't have this broad coalition of people that was really out fighting for social justice and criminal justice reform and stuff like that. And now we do, you know, and that makes me modify my statement a bit, right? And my attitude a bit, because at 26 years old, I felt a certain way. Now at 55, as a more mature person and seeing the assistance and seeing the reach out and people recognizing white privilege and people actually white people saying, yeah, there is white privilege and we need to start looking at this. That helps try to uh, rectify uh, some of the things that have happened to black Americans and people of other uh, shades and ethnicities along the way over the 400 year experiment that we're living in. You know, I support Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the flag just as much as I support the individual who takes offense to Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the flag. You know, I couldn't be an American and be proud to be an American if I didn't recognize both truths to be equal at the same time in the same space because I have a niece named Dreamer Dyson, and I have a cousin named Kenya Wade who both went over and fought in theater in Iraq and Afghanistan, one as a translator and one out on a ship in the Persian Gulf. And I couldn't be who I am if I didn't support them, even if I didn't agree with why they went over there. You see, and uh, this is what I mean when my voice is echoing across the decades, the maturity is coming along with it, you know, and the reasoning behind why we're doing what we're doing and what makes me a unique individual at this time and space comes into play at that point. Because I still understand F the police. Some people ask questions like, what would you tell your younger self now that you've experienced what you experienced at your age of 55? You must have been reading every interview I've given at San Quentin, at St. Denver State Prison, and the one I just gave last week with, uh, with Brittany of the, of the Five Desert Fools. And, and Cam, I asked them the same thing. So how old am I? Am I, am I talking to what, what your old self? You're, you're talking to your 16-year-old self. At 55? Mm-hmm. I would tell my 16-year-old self, it's not as bad as it looks right now. It will get better, but you have to remain patient. And your patience is going to take a long time to form. But if you stay patient, it will get better. I think that's what I would tell my 16-year-old self. Let me ask you this. I was able to discover for myself a few of my I'm not. I'm not good enough. I'm not worth it. In your subconscious mind, at those young ages, did you have a I'm not? Yeah, I'm not tough enough, um, I'm not big enough, I'm not strong enough, you know. The sad part about the, that is, in my younger self, that fueled me to be even more dangerous than I actually probably would have been. But I was always questioning, you know, because I, I didn't really get any muscle shape until after I came out of prison the first time, you know. Uh, I'm not crazy enough, you know. I'm not wild enough, I'm not, I'm not monstrous enough. You know, um, then that switched over once I started studying uh, religion and spirituality. And then it became, I'm not humble enough. You know, uh, I don't pray enough. I don't reflect enough. I don't help other people enough. You know, it switched over from negative to positive. And in a way, I still do it. Uh, me and my niece were talking and I was telling her, my reality is I'm an ex-con on parole living in a transition home. Because I've been invited to go to the Warrior game and do public address announcements, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not that person yet. I'm still an ex-con on parole living in a transition home. And as long as I maintain that level of humility, then wherever I get to, because my goal is to call the NBA Final Series, if I make it there, it's because I was humble enough not to bite into the first spark of fame that came at me. You know, not to get big headed and not start bragging about it. Just this happened because I worked for it. You know, um, I got to the VBL the same way. I got to the ABA the same way. You know, I could have easily, man, I'm in the VBL, fool. <laughs> man, I went from making nothing. I, they was giving me soups and sodas doing play by play in prison. Fool, the first day I did this, 
they broke me off two big faces. What? Man, the first time I went to the ABA, man, they called me in and gave me $300 to call two games, fool. I'm in. This is it. This is what I should have been doing. No. I'm thankful for the opportunity to get out of prison so I can call games. I'm thankful for being a Doc Waller because I was able to film a, a documentary while I was there. You know, I'm thankful for meeting Kevin Daly in the swap meet. Getting some elevated entertainment t-shirts made my company that we came up with. And meeting him and getting into the ABA and making that partnership between elevated entertainment and the Amer uh, American Basketball Prime TV. I'm grateful for that because through that I met Dr. Sharin. Through Dr. Sharin I meet you. You know, a doctor who does things a little bit differently than everybody else, right? But it's getting major results. Who then tells me about Farron, right? Like, man, you might want to be associated with the Oxnard Orcas. Well, who are they? Oh, that's the film crew that was in Long Beach. The people that came actually like they was out there to film something. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see where this goes, you know? But if I'd have been arrogant and, you know, none of this stuff would be happening. Yeah. None of it. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I was arrogant. Or it would definitely come off as arrogant if I did make it. Like, man, fair, you put him on? Are you serious? That dude's a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> Rakim. Holy, Holy are you. you. Yeah. What's up with that song? Yeah, that that Rakim is the is a rapper who helped me develop spiritually because the things that he wrote about in his raps, I ended up researching when I got deep into spirituality. And Holy Are You has a verse that says, uh, for those that find it hard to believe, and it is why they call me the God MC, the lyricist, right? And that intro alone is like, if you find it hard to believe, understand that I'm the God MC. Meaning for me, you might find this hard to believe the things that I'm about to say and the things that I've studied that's gonna Make me say what I'm about to say. But you better believe I've studied it and I know exactly what I'm talking about when I say it. Later on in the rap, he says, uh, walk on water, no, nah, leave it to Jesus. It's a parable to make followers and readers believe it. From Egypt to Budapest, Rakim is the truest left, understanding scriptures like the minister Louis F. Now, I'm not a follower of the Nation of Islam and I'm not a follower of Louis Farrakhan. But Louis Farrakhan has said some things in the last five years that have been extremely profound, right? So I don't have to like the person who's making the statement to understand the truth of the statement that's being said, right? And that's how I looked at that. And then he named off Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, right, as prophets that we're supposed to look toward, right, as examples of how we live our life. So what did these prophets have in, have in common? The first thing they had in common, all of them lived like the lowest person in the land. They didn't live in castles. They didn't live in big homes. If the lowest person in the, in the land was a vagabond with a stick over his shoulder and, a, and, his, and his grip at the end of the stick, that's how that prophet lived. You know, kings would come and sit at their feet with the poor, with this dude that everybody respected. But, you know, they would, oh, why are we sitting over here with them? That's the dirty people, you know. Well, I'm a dirty dude, you know what I'm saying? I'm a ghetto prophet, you know, and for me, my role as a role model is starting to become clear because people who come from the same neighborhood I come from and people who come from the same prison circumstances I come from now have a person that they can look at and say, look, if that dude right there, and I know how he was when he was growing up, I remember him as a gangbanger, if he can make it when he got out the way he did, then I can do it, you know? And that's more important to me than anything else is to understand that at 55, I've become more of a father figure, but even more a role model for a lot of guys in prison who are literally cheering me on. My biggest cheering block is in CDCR. Dudes are clapping their hands at every step I make. And so Holy Are You reminds me that I'm also walking in the footsteps of prophets while I'm also walking in the footsteps of grimy ghetto dudes who need a role model. And so I'm trying to find a balance and strike it between the two. I have a grandnephew I have to be a model for, two of them, as a matter of fact, you know, and I have to learn to be patient with them. You know, I have nieces and nephews I have to learn to be patient with them. I have a mother that I have to learn to be patient with, you know, and so in each one of those aspects, holy are you, is reminding me, dude, you got more on your, on your shoulders than you think you do. 
So you got to constantly be aware of what you say and what you do. Above the Clouds by Gangstar. Oh, man. <laughs> you couldn't pick which one was your favorite song, so I'll give you both. I Self, Lord and Master, right? Islam, that's a, uh, that's a uh, acronym for uh, I-S-L-A-M. But I add an extra A because I know Arabic and I know the Islam actually has two A's at the end. So it's, it's I Self, Lord and Allah's Master. Shall bring disaster to evil factors. Demonic chapters shall be captured by kings through the storms of days after, from the earth to the sun, through triple darkness to blaster, with a force that can't be compared to any firepower, for it's mind power shared. You know, and in those in that verse right there, just that part of the beginning of the verse is a connection from me beginning my existence or everybody's existence beginning as a spark of, and a star. And then coming through the portal of a woman's uh, uterus and being born through the vaginal canal. And then we connecting not just on mind power, right? Hooking in intimately, mentally in these conversations, right? But spiritually hooking up the same way and giving honor to women in the process before we start saying and doing anything. All honor goes to women because it's through that shaped, that chalice, quote unquote, which is that shape that I'm pointing out now when we start talking about the uterus and the vaginal sleeve comes out. That's that quote unquote holy chalice. And so we sip from that and give a toast to women at all times because it's through them that we come through the portal from outer space to inner space to earth, right? And then we start linking up mentally and having these intimate conversations. And how are we supposed to build around us? How do we build a family? How do we build a business? How do we build a community, build a city, build a nation? How do we build these things in peace? Right. And so we start sharing these thoughts. And then we there's another part of the verse that comes in later when we look at the reflections at night off the lake. Right. And the reflections at night coming off the sacred lake is me looking in the mirror at myself. And am I being true to myself? Are you being true to yourself? You know, what I'm saying, are we being the men that we were raised to be? Or are we being the men that society tells us to be? You know, I know this may get a little heavy for the audience because everybody's used to me being a clown and I got jokes and whatnot. But I'm really serious about my spiritual teachings and my spiritual studies. And every now and then I open up and give you a glimpse of who I really am. You know what I'm saying? I'm living a fleshly existence only for a little while until I go back to the stars again. Just like everybody else who learns how to elevate themselves. The true meaning of woke is to be spiritually in touch with oneself and to understand your physical makeup and the things that make you a spiritual being in a physical body. Not just because you read some book not just because somebody showed you something on YouTube, but it's actually going through the process of fasting, meditation, late night worship, right? And then preparing yourself for when that which exists outside comes in and grabs you, right? And then uplifts you. This is the reason people go fight in the military because it's a, hard, it's a larger call than themselves. It's the reason people become individuals that go into the community and feed the homeless is because there's something larger than themselves at work. And they're willing to humble themselves to the experience and then go and willing to give their life for it. If we had more people doing that, right, then I could set up and say above the clouds, above the crowds where the sounds are ethereal, right? I wouldn't limit myself to the clouds. I can literally shoot out to the exosphere and go into outer space, you know, and then come back and tell you about it. But in the meantime, right now, I just got to sit up. You know what I'm saying? Close the portal door right now. Get back to making people laugh because that's what they'd rather do. Laugh than think. <laughs> On a serious tip, man, thank you for tuning in. I know I'm a clown sometimes, but that's what it's about sometimes. Just the ability to make somebody laugh. Because sometimes laughter is a medicine that can't just, you know, be injected. Um, I also want to take this moment, and really seriously, because I don't get the opportunity enough in these interviews to say this. If the survivors of my crimes are listening, I want you to know that I am profoundly and humbly sorry for the actions I did back in 1994. Not just to you, but the effect that it had on your family and the effect that it had on the community. From the EMTs to the police officers who responded to the hospital when I went out to King Hospital and doctors had to work on me and my issues rather than working on somebody who may have been hurt. You know, just the time and the energy that was taken away from my actions back in 94. I humbly apologize to everybody for that. And I'm striving hard to be a better person. Hard to be a better person. I'm striving real hard to be a better person than I was in 94. 
And um, I know America is a country of second chances, and I'm just asking that mine be honored, you know, and that I get my opportunity for my second chance. And when it happens, you best believe I'm going to be a person who's appreciative of it. 22nd time out. Stay tuned. Back after the break.